Thank you. A friend of mine was recently asked to deliver a commencement speech. And he gave considerable thought to this, his talk, but despite this, he was unable to come up with a central theme for the talk. As he approached the assembly hall on the night that he was to make the speech, he still hadn't selected a theme. But as he went through the door to the auditorium, he saw the magic word, push. Well, just instantly, the light flashed, and he said, that's it. Push, drive, determination. And he stressed those features throughout his talk. He concluded his remarks by saying, graduates, you'll find your key to the success in this world on the door as you leave the auditorium tonight. Well, he had aroused such enthusiasm that the entire audience could hardly wait to find that magic word on the door. And what do you suppose they found? That's right, the word pull. <laughs> well, personally, I'm a great believer in luck. And the harder I work, the luckier I seem to be. You know, it's the dream of every young man and every young woman in America to be a success, to have parents, teachers, friends, and loved ones look upon us with pride. We are all hopeful of making a significant contribution to the world. Graduates, your graduation from Utah Technical College this evening will assist you to fulfill this dream. And I hope that each of you will have the courage to go out into the world to seek fame and fortune. However, you should remember what Confucius say. Men who go out to set the world on fire sometimes come home for more matches. Well, what is this magic word called success? I'm sure that it means different things to different people. From my point of view, however, success is a feeling of personal satisfaction and pride. And we receive that feeling when we realize that we have accomplished an objective. It's that exhilarating feeling that we experience when we've completed a project or a plan. It's that buoyancy that we get when we realize that we have developed an ability. It's achieving goals that we established and have worked diligently to accomplish. It may be winning a race, climbing a mountain, operating a successful business, or rearing a wonderful family. It definitely means utilizing your talents. And it may or may not mean the acquisition of material things. Incidentally, last year, I succeeded in doing something that I've been wanting to do since 1962. I bought myself a 1962 Cadillac. <laughs> Success is that ability to solve our difficulties. And this can best be done by taking God into our lives on Monday morning and keeping him with us throughout the entire week. A college professor was dreaming that he was lecturing to his class. Strangely enough, he awakened to find out that he was. I can assure you, however, the man who wakes and finds himself a success hasn't been asleep. And I can also assure you that striving to be successful brings not only material success, but satisfaction, fulfillment, and happiness. We showed a film at the college a few months ago entitled Second Effort, featuring the dedicated football chief of the Green Bay Packers, Mr. Vince Lombardi. I was very impressed with the ideas he advanced on how to achieve success. Vince Lombardi said, Hard work is the price we must pay for success. We can achieve most anything in this life, but we must be willing to pay the price, and the price for success is hard work. Well, do you know that the Green Bay Packers won five professional football championships in eight years under his guidance and leadership? He listed a number of rules which all of us could use as success guideposts in our lives. Some of these rules I was very much impressed with and would like to state them briefly for you this evening. The first rule he gave was that we should keep ourselves in good physical condition. If we do, we feel good, we have a fine attitude, and attitude is most important. His second rule was self-discipline, he stated, is essential to build character, and it takes a lot of courage to build character. And the third thing he said was, 
winning isn't everything. It's the only thing. Winning requires determination and dedication. You've got to want to be a champion if you're going to achieve your goal. And you've got to want to succeed if you're going to be successful. His fourth rule was, do the best you're capable of at all times. And last, he said, if you don't succeed the first time, make the second effort. The second effort is as essential in life as it is in the world of sports. Well, according to the Lombardi philosophy, there are three important things in life. Your religion, your family, and your job. And according to Mr. Lombardi, sometimes your job must come first. Another great American, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, points out that planning is an essential in our personal lives, just as essential, he says, as it is in business, in church, in government, or in education. It is essential, he says, that we establish goals and then direct all our efforts and energies to accomplish them. Objectives, he says, are absolutely necessary to guide us toward the ultimate goal. You know, if I want to accomplish an objective, a man can tell me to go to hell, and I'm going to act like I'm looking forward to the trip. I think it was Abraham Lincoln who said, if you're tarred and feathered and ridden out of town on a rail, just pretend like you're leading a parade. In the College Instructional Media Center, we have a number of tapes which contain outstanding speeches by prominent individuals. Not too long ago, I listened to a speech by a gentleman by the name of Bob Richards, the Wheaties promoter. Mr. Richards is an Olympic champion. He won two gold medals. He's a former minister and a successful businessman. Some of you may have had the pleasure to hear him a short time ago when he made an appearance here in Salt Lake City. It's interesting to me, however, that his philosophy is almost parallel to that of Vince Lombardi's. Bob Richards says, he loves the sports world because it's a language of fight. You don't get anywhere in this world, he says, without work and without effort. And if you want to be great, you've got to work, put out. Success, according to Mr. Richards, is 99% perspiration, and that means work, work, work. Mr. Richards claims that it's that tiny little bit more that makes the difference between the champion and the other competitors. Bob Richards says you've got to be physically fit. He puts it this way. If you want to be enthusiastic, you've got to be in shape. Your zeal and zest for life grows when you feel great. Watch how your love of life grows and watch how your attitude about life improves when you're physically fit. You will remember Lombardi's first rule was you must be in good physical condition. Mr. Richards says, You'll never be great if you don't love what you're doing. Lombardi said it this way. You've got to want to be a champion. You've got to want to be a success. You've got to want to make a commitment. You must make a commitment or you will never achieve your goal. And Bob Richards concluded his speech by saying, if you want to be enthusiastic, then put God in your life. Put God in your life and you'll win, and you'll succeed. I hope that each of you has or will develop a plan which will detail your life's objectives, and then I hope you'll proceed to accomplish those objectives one step at a time. I believe that to be successful, an individual must believe in himself, make a total commitment to our career and our families, put God in our lives, we must love what we're doing, and we must be willing to work hard to achieve the goal of success. Ladies and gentlemen, our program will now continue as printed until we arrive at the point where we will introduce the principal speaker of the evening. <coughs> short and most enjoyable. I now look forward to two years in the Army. I wonder if when I get out I'll be able to say that they're short and enjoyable. 
Federal statistics reveal that during the current fiscal year, $375 out of every $1,000 of federal taxes is being spent on military defense, while only $1.40 is being allocated to technical voca vocational education. This meager allowance shows to some extent the small priority that is being given to technical vocational education. Some people even object to this small amount, claiming that there is little evidence that vocational education really does the job it should. Technical vocational education is funding is far below the level needed in today's growing industry. From the January and February issues of industrial education, it is estimated that more than 40 million new workers will join the working force during the 1970s. When you consider the fact that 80% of all job opportunities are in the technical vocational field, it makes you wonder how 14 one hundredths of 1% 1 of the tax dollar is going to be enough to train the people needed in the technical and engineering fields. Also, from the same issues of industrial education, there is a forecast of need for an estimated 31,000 new technical industrial technicians and engineers every year for the next 10 years. In addition, there will be jobs for 15,000 draftsmen every year. Vocational schools will need to produce 20,000 skilled machinists and tool and die makers every year to join those already employed in the metal machine field. Today, there are approximately 480,000 people employed in welding. The demand for new welders will be about 23,000 a year. These figures justify continuing and increasing the funds allocated to technical vocational education. It is appalling to see such a small amount of money being allocated to these fields when in the next 10, year, 10 years, the need for these workers will increase by half. The politicians and national administrators who are responsible for the money allocated to technical vocational education should see and become concerned about the projections for job availabilities in the future. For it is these men that are directly responsible for the tailoring of our educational programs. These men in authority must make sure that there are opportunities for students to obtain training in these growing, rapidly growing fields. I am pleased and very satisfied in the fact that I have had and have taken advantage of the opportunity for technical vocational education. As a student, I have gained self-assurance and confidence in my abilities, for I have gained the knowledge of my chosen field from the years of experience of my teachers, for they are professionals in their field before they are allowed to come to Utah Technical College and teach. And now, as graduates of Utah Technical College, we are not afraid of what the future will bring. For in our journey through life, <clears throat> when we run into our prospective employer, and he asks us, why do we feel that we are qualified for a position in his company? We will answer, because, sir, we are graduates of Utah Technical College. over. There have been many times when I felt like I'm going to quit tomorrow. I just can't do it. It will never end. Then here I am graduating and I feel good to know that I am prepared to enter into my chosen field. To look back and think that wasn't so bad after all. It has been worth every minute. Happiness, as Webster defines it, is the state of being happy. I would like to define happiness as a student might define it. Happiness is doing the kind of work you enjoy. Happiness is preparing for your life work in a proud, productive, and rewarding field. Happiness is you working as a secretary, a mechanic, medical assistant, accountant, programmer, or as a specialist in any one of thousands of occupations. Happiness is vocational technical education because it prepares you to enter into and succeed in a chosen vocation or occupation where the highest percentage of employment is available in the state of Utah. Vocational technical education is the bridge between man and his work, which is necessary for millions to secure employment and to progress in that employment. Every man or woman wants to provide for their family with honor and dignity and to be counted as an individual. 
helping the individual to prepare himself for employability as he leaves school and throughout his working life is the major goal of Utah Technical College and should be a major goal of all education. The world of school and the world of work must become one world. An old Chinese proverb states, if you give a man a fish, he will have a single meal. If you teach him how to fish, he will eat all his life. The society which tends to scorn excellence in the humble activities and tolerate shyness in the exalted activities is building castles in the air. We need excellence in both activities if we are to have a strong foundation to build on, for castles in the air soon tumble to the ground. In an age of rapidly changing technology, I congratulate the graduating class of UTC of 1971 for preparing for these changes and developing in themselves a proud and productive life work. Tonight, you are sitting with others who have set a goal to contribute to society and are now on the threshold of this meaningful life goal. You are now prepared to enter into the life work you have chosen. It will prove proud and productive. As Curtis P. Harding, State Administrator, Department of Employment Security said, we've become a job-oriented society. You're nobody to yourself, your friends, or your children unless you have a job. Represent Utah Technical College at Salt Lake Well. It is a great and growing college with a significant role in the future of many people and the life work they choose. Be proud, for you are in a position to contribute to your fellow man with your hands, mind, and heart. Happiness is graduating. I think that would be an excellent example of an individual has, who has dedicated his life to the accomplishment of an objective. I've known Ron Clark since he was a young man, and I can assure you that he has spent hours and hours and hours and hours of practice. Perhaps some of you have seen him on television. I had the opportunity a couple of years ago to attend a convention in Florida. While I was there, I had the opportunity to listen to a number of very famous individuals. And one of those individuals happened to be Dr. Werner von Braun. I recall the <clears throat> chairman gave him a very, very flattering introduction. <clears throat> but it went on and on and on considerably longer than von Braun expected it to go. And so when he got up to speak, he made a choice comment. He said, that's the kind of speech I could listen to all night. And for a while, I thought I was going to. <clears throat> Having learned a lesson from long introductions, I shall attempt to introduce our guest speaker of the evening briefly. Prior to his present appointment in January of this year, he was the general sales manager for IML Freight Incorporated. He was with IML for 15 years as a salesman, city and district sales manager, director of advertising, public relations, sales promotion, sales training, and finally assistant vice president of marketing. Mr. Fred S. Ball, the executive secretary of the Salt Lake Chamber of Commerce, presently serves as president of the Sales and Marketing Council of America Trucking Associations. Recently, he completed a term as president of the American Trucking Association's Public Relations Coordinating Committee. And he's the first man to ever hold these two large jobs in the organizations. He was a former student body president of Weber State College, attended the University of Utah, did graduate work at <coughs> Stanford University, he presently serves on the board of directors of the American Red Cross, United Cerebral Palsy, Junior Achievement, and the Salt Lake Advertising Club. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce to you
Mr. Fred S. Ball, Executive Secretary of the Salt Lake Area Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Ball. You know, it's been a long time since I donned a raiment such as this tonight, these cap and gowns, and yet I feel the very same feeling tonight that I felt the first time I put one on. A lot of people think they look rather funny, and there are many in our midst today who said we ought to do away with them. They're old-fashioned, they're ridiculous, and they should be abolished. It's only tradition, they say. Let's do away with them. Only tradition. And yet, you know, I think frequently that tradition is one of the things that really has made this country so great. Tradition. We keep the old that's very good, and then we innovate, we change, and we improve that which is obsolete and superfluous. These caps and gowns that you and I wear tonight are traditional. A symbol, if you will, a, perhaps a symbol of attainment or a symbol of accomplishment, and that's really why you're here this evening, you people, with these caps and gowns, to be honored for your accomplishment. And now it's so important that you continue to accomplish, continue this process of learning, to attain, to succeed. I was so impressed this evening with your president's word about success. There's too many of our people in our civilization today who really don't think it's quite that important. They'd rather sit on the sidelines or drop out rather than compete to succeed. Well, these caps and gowns are tradition. They are a sign of accomplishment. And you know, I recall so vividly the first time I ever had the opportunity of putting one on. It was a very warm June night in 1950. And I walked down the aisle very proudly as a member of the graduating class of Ogden High School. June 1950, 21 years ago. And you know, as we marched in our procession, I recall that all of us sang as loud as we could, right at the top of our voices, a song that they taught us for the occasion. And I recall the words to this day. We sang, I love life, I want to live, to drink of life's fullness, take all it can give. I love life, every moment must count, to glory in its fullness and revel in its fount. I love life and I want to live. I love life. You know, it was a great feeling. As we walked in, my wife has been telling me now for 19 years that I can't carry a tune, but I was singing loudly that night with all the vigor I could because I did love life, and I still do. And I hope you young people share that same great feeling because now you're embarking on a great segment of this sojourn here upon this earth, and you better love life because we're here perhaps for a long time. And as Ron sang so very beautifully, we're only going to come this way once. So let's make the very most out of it we possibly can. And you know, sometimes this life of ours can be a little rough because we're going to face disappointments. We're going to have some discouragements and failures. And yet, you know, really that's how we grow, through our failures and through our disappointments and our discouragements by learning from them. This, this life of ours isn't really supposed to be that easy. We sometimes are not going to be able to meet our goals and objectives. But we keep striving. We make that second effort. And it's frequently tough to meet all the challenges of today. But, you know, I think it's good that it's not going to be that easy. Because I've found that the easy way is not always necessarily the best way. I have a, a brother-in-law who lives up in Ogden who is an avid hunter. Every year he goes out deer hunting. And this last season he went out with one of his companions and he had particularly good luck. Because he brought down the biggest buck he'd ever seen in his life a great big ten-point buck. And Milt ran over after he and his companion after they brought this down and they grabbed this deer by the hind legs and they started pulling it toward their truck. But it was a big deer and it was heavy and they sweat and strained and pulled and tugged and it was a hard job getting that toward their truck. And just as they were working so hard, a game warden came out of the woods there. And he said, look, you guys are working too hard. I can make it a lot easier for you. Notice how you're pulling from the hind legs. And if you'll notice how the, the hair grows on a buck from the front to the back, you fellows, by pulling from the hind legs there, you're pulling against the grain of the hair and you're causing friction. Now, if you'll go on the other side and pull from the front, get all those front legs and start pulling, now you're pulling with the grain and it's going to be a lot easier job for you. 
So they were pretty tired. They thought they'd better try anything. So they went around to the other end. They got hold of those front legs and they started to pull. And you know, amazingly enough, it worked. They were making great progress now and they were pulling right along and moving very rapidly. And Milt said to his friend, he said, man, I'm glad that guy came along. Have you noticed how we started pulling from the front legs, how much easier it is, how much better progress we're making? And his companion said, yeah, but have you noticed how we're getting further and further away from the truck? (laughs) You see, frequently the easy way is not necessarily the best way. But if you strive for certain goals and then make very sure you're heading in the right direction, you're going to get closer and closer to your goals and objectives. You people two years ago established some very realistic goals and objectives. And you've worked, and you've studied, and you've applied yourself, and you've reached this goal. But now you've got another task facing you because you've got to establish some new goals now. And they might not be easy. But as I say, it's not always the easy way that's the best way. So pull and pull in the right direction. And don't think it's going to be easy, but don't become discouraged. Not long ago, just a year ago this month, a great man by the name of Eric A. Walker, who was the president of Pennsylvania State University, he filled a a position very much like I'm filling tonight. He was speaking to a commencement exercise to a group of graduates. And I've read his ideas and thoughts over several times, and I've been very impressed. What I'd like to do is perhaps plagiarize just a few of his thoughts, because I thought he made a lot of sense in the things that he said. He said something like this. He said, no one has more pride in the accomplishments of you young people, you graduates tonight, than your elder generation. But I'm not going to tell the older generation how bright you people are. Now, I'm not going to stand here and tell how great you people are because you've attained this thing or how bright you are. Nor am I going to tell you that these people around the sides and up in the balcony have made a total mess of things And that now you are going to be the hope of mankind. Because what I'd like to do tonight is maybe reverse that process a little bit. For if you'll look around here, you young people, if you'll look at these people on the sides and the back and up in the balcony, I'm going to introduce you to some of the most remarkable people ever to walk this earth. I will reintroduce you to some of the most remarkable people that you've ever known, people that you might want to thank on this graduation day, because these people I'm talking about are your parents and your grandparents. Let me tell you a little bit about them. Let's not talk about you, but let's talk about them for a minute. These people, these parents and grandparents of yours, are the people who within just five decades have, by their work, increased your life expectancy by approximately 50%, and who, while cutting the work days by a third, have more than doubled per capita income and output. These are the people who have given you a healthier world than they found, and because of this, You're not going to have to fear epidemics of flu and typhus, diphtheria, smallpox, scarlet fever, measles, or mumps that these people knew in their youth, and the dreaded polio that as a young man we used to fear so much that we couldn't even go swimming during the summer months, or we were afraid to go to a movie because polio was rampant. You know, this is really not even a medical factor anymore. Tuberculosis today is almost unheard of, and yet we dreaded it for many, many years. Yes, this is a remarkable generation of people sitting here tonight. Let me remind you that these remarkable people also lived and worked through history's greatest depression. Many of these people knew what it really meant to be poor. They really knew what it meant to be hungry and cold. And because of this, they determined it would not happen to you, that you'd have a better life, that you'd have food to eat and milk to drink and vitamins to nourish you and a warm house, better schools, and greater opportunity to succeed than they had. And because they gave you the best, you're the tallest, healthiest, brightest, and probably the best-looking generation ever to inhabit this great world of ours. And because of these people here tonight who are so proud of you, you're going to work fewer hours. You're going to learn more. You're going to have more leisure time and travel to more distant places and have more of a chance to follow your life's ambition. These also are the people who fought the world's grisliest war. These are the people who defeated the tyranny of Hitler and who, when it was all over, had the compassion to spend literally billions and billions of dollars to help their former enemies rebuild their homelands. And these are the people who also had the sense to dream and formulate and start the United Nations. Well, it was representative of these two generations 
who through the highest court of the land fought racial discrimination at every turn to begin a new era in civil rights. They built thousands of high schools. They trained and hired tens of thousands of better teachers. And at the same time, they made higher education a very real possibility for millions of youngsters. And you know, it wasn't many, many years ago that this opportunity for higher education was the dream of only a few, and a very wealthy few at that. And they made a start, and I'll admit, perhaps it was a late one, in healing the scars of this earth, and in fighting pollution, and the destruction of our natural environment. But they did, they started, and they set into motion new laws giving conservation new meaning, and setting aside land for you and your children to enjoy for generations to come. And while they've done all these things, it's true they've had some failures, because we have not yet found an alternative for war, nor for racial hatred. Perhaps you, the members of this graduating class, will perfect the social mechanisms by which all men may follow their ambitions without the threat of force, so that this earth will no longer need police to enforce the laws, nor armies to prevent some men from trespassing against others. But we, your older generation, these your parents and your grandparents, made more progress by the sweat of their brows than in any previous era. And I don't think you should ever forget that. And if you young people here, if you people of your generation can make as much progress in as many areas as these two generations have, you should be able to solve a great many of the world's remaining ills. So that's my hope tonight. And I know the hope of all of these people along the sides and the backs and up in the balcony, that you find the answers that we couldn't find that you can solve many of these problems that still plague mankind. And it won't be easy. It's not going to be easy. And you won't do it by negative thought, nor by tearing down, or by bombing, or by breaking, or be, by belittling. You may and you can do it by hard work, and by humility, and by hope, and by faith in mankind. You know, I began my little presentation tonight by telling you about that song I sang 21 years ago when I graduated from high school. And I'd like to maybe tell you some words of another song I heard just about two weeks ago at a church meeting I attended. It says beautifully some of the things that I'd like to say and don't have the, the way to do it. Because this country means a great deal to me. I love this great land. I love this government of ours. I love this great state and this great city. And the problems that we have and the challenges that you and not your generation face maybe are summed up a little bit about these words I heard in this great song. Wish Ron could sing them for us. The song is, Where in the World But in America? Perhaps you've heard it. Here in a world of wondering and blundering, fear and want turning willing men to killing men, let's all share with the other folk, our brother folk, because that's the old American way. There are millions of people hungering, warmongering, victims of animosities, atrocities. Let's all help them increasingly, unceasingly. That's the old American way. Where in the world but in America? Where, oh, where but in America? Where, oh, where in the world but in America can you sing true freedom song? For freedom is dying heedlessly, unneedlessly as men lose opportunity and unity. Let's help them to belong again, be strong again. That's the old American way. Yes, darkness is deep on every hand in every land. The sacred rights we've been cherishing are perishing. But we'll preserve Christianity, humanity. That's the old American way. Ours is to keep the holy light forever bright. Ours is to share every sacred shrine that's yours and mine. Ours to hold freedom's flag unfurled for all the world. That's the old American way. Where in the world but in America? Where, oh, where but in America? Where in the world but in America? Can you sing true freedom's song? Have you ever thought how fortunate you are to live in the land you live in, to have the opportunities that you have? I remember as a very young man, my father used to always tell me where much is given, much is expected. And you people have been given much, and so much is expected of you. 
I'd like to close before I sit down with just a little formula for advice that I started talking about around our community some time ago. At one time it was original, but Dan Valentine put it in his column, and not long ago I received a clipping from the San Francisco Chronicle where Herb Cain also picked it up. But I have a theory that if you really want to be successful, there are four things you've got to do. And I'm not just going to be talking now to the graduates. I'll talk to the parents and grandparents that I praised a moment ago. If you want to be successful in whatever you do, there's four things you've got to do. And they're these. You've got to drink. You've got to swear. You have to lie. And you have to steal. Now, if you young people will do these four things, you're going to make all these goals and objectives we talked about. First of all, you've got to drink. You've got to drink in all the knowledge you possibly can because knowledge is power. And you people are taking a great step in that direction now. The glory of God is intelligence. So don't stop learning now. Drink in all the knowledge you possibly can. Never stop learning. Never stop going to school. Never stop reading. Knowledge is power. So drink in all the knowledge you possibly can. And then you've got to swear. You've got to swear to do the best job you possibly can. Because now you're trained, you have the attributes, you have the talents and the abilities, don't waste them. Swear to do the best job you possibly can. And believe me, nobody will ever ask you to do more. Swear to do your best, and you're going to succeed. And then you've got to lie. When you get home tonight, lie. Lie down. I'm reaching a little bit, aren't I? And think what I said a moment ago, how blessed you are. How fortunate you are to have this great education you have, to live where you live, to have the parents that you have. Lie down and think again. Where much is given, much is expected. Make a contribution to this society of ours. If there's something you don't like, change it. But change it the right way. Lie down tonight and just think, what did I do? Why have I been given so much? Why am I so blessed? And if you can come up with that answer, you're going to do a lot more things for your community, for your family, for your faith, whatever it might be. And then finally, the last thing you've got to do, and you've got to do this every day, because you can't do all these things alone we've talked about, you've got to steal. You've got to steal every day just a little time for prayer.